Don't you just love it when somebody starts a conversation with you by saying, can I say something to you without you getting mad? (laughs) You know it's going to be one of those conversations. This is the LifeSpring Family Audio Bible coming to you from Riverside, California. Podcasting since 2004, I'm your OG Godcaster, Steve Webb. This is the daily podcast where we'll read through the entire Bible in a year, and I hope you're having an outstanding day. Today is Poetry Thursday, and we'll read chapters 3 and 4 of the book of Job. As always, after the reading, I'll have some comments for you, and I'm calling the show Don't Be Like That. But before we read, let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the book of Job, and we ask that you bless our reading today. Give us understanding and give us receptive hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's begin. Job chapter 3 After this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. And Job spoke and said, May the day perish on which I was born, and the night in which it was said, A male child is conceived. May that day be darkness. May God above not seek it nor the light shine upon it. May darkness and the shadow of death claim it. May a cloud settle on it. May the blackness of the day terrify it. As for that night, may darkness seize it. May it not rejoice among the days of the year. May it not come into the number of the months. Oh, may that night be barren. May no joyful shout come into it. May those curse it who curse the day, those who are ready to arouse Leviathan. May the stars of its morning be dark. May it look for light, but have none, and not see the dawning of the day, because it did not shut up the doors of my mother's womb, nor hide sorrow from my eyes. Why did I not die at birth? Why did I not perish when I came from the womb? Why did the knees receive me? Or why the breasts that I should nurse? For now I would have lain still and been quiet. I would have been asleep. Then I would have been at rest with kings and counselors of the earth who built ruins for themselves, or with princes who had gold, who filled their houses with silver. Or why was I not hidden like a stillborn child, like infants who never saw light? There the wicked cease from troubling, and there the weary are at rest. There the prisoners rest together. They do not hear the voice of the oppressor. The small and great are there, and the servant is free from his master. Why is light given to him who is in misery, and life to the bitter of soul, who long for death, but it does not come, and search for it more than hidden treasures, who rejoice exceedingly, and are glad when they can find the grave? Why is light given to a man whose way is hidden, and whom God has hedged in? For my sighing comes before I eat, and my groanings pour out like water. For the thing I greatly feared has come upon me, and what I dreaded has happened to me. I am not at ease, nor am I quiet. I have no rest, for trouble comes. Job chapter 4 Eliphaz Job, will you be annoyed if I speak? I can't keep quiet any longer. You have taught many people and given strength to feeble hands. When someone stumbled, weak and tired, your words encouraged him to stand. Now it's your turn to be in trouble, and you are too stunned to face it. You worshipped God, and your life was blameless, so you should have confidence and hope. Think back now. Name a single case where someone righteous met with disaster. I have seen people plow fields of evil and plant wickedness like seed. Now they harvest wickedness and evil. Like a storm, God destroys them in His anger. The wicked roar and growl like lions, but God silences them and breaks their teeth. Like lions with nothing to kill and eat, they die and all their children are scattered. Once a message came quietly, so quietly I could hardly hear it. Like a nightmare, it disturbed my sleep. I trembled and shuddered. My whole body shook with fear. A light breeze touched my face, and my skin crawled with fright. I could see something standing there. I stared, but I couldn't tell what it was. Then I heard a voice out of the silence. Can anyone be righteous in the sight of God or be pure before His Creator? God does not trust His heavenly servants. He finds fault even with His angels. Do you think He will trust a creature of clay, a thing of dust that can be crushed like a moth? 
We may be alive in the morning, but die unnoticed before evening comes. All that we have is taken away. We die still lacking wisdom. They say that one of the best indicators of one's strength of character and, I'll throw in, relationship with God, is how we deal with hardship. Do we collapse like a house of cards, or do we rise up, steal ourselves, ask the Lord for wisdom and strength, and keep on keeping on? How we react to circumstances is a choice. We decide. Well, as chapter 3 opens, Job has just lost nearly everything. Most of his wealth, his children, and his health. And his wife has just told him to curse God and die. Thanks, sweetheart. (laughs) He doesn't have much more to lose, does he? Well, remember, Satan wins if Job does curse God. That was Satan's challenge. And so, with the opening of chapter 3, we have the opening salvo in the battle for Job's mind and soul. Will he curse God? Will he fold? How will he decide to deal with his great loss, the physical and emotional pain he's in? How will he think about what others think about him? What will he think about God in light of his circumstances? Well, most of the remainder of this book that bears his name will reveal the answers to these questions. We'll see Job's character and his relationship with God, and maybe we can learn from Job so that when we face loss and pain, as everybody does, we'll be better prepared to make choices for our reactions that will glorify God. And as the chapter opens, Job curses the day he was born and the night that he was conceived. Given his present suffering, he'd rather have never existed. Well, that makes me think of the Jimmy Stewart Christmas movie, It's a Wonderful Life. You know the story. Stewart's character, George Bailey, a good man who's loved by his wife, his kids, and most of the little town he lives in, comes into some tough times through no fault of his own. And in the depths of feeling sorry for himself, and as he ponders whether or not he should jump off of the bridge and into the icy drink, he says, I wish I'd never been born. And so an angel arranges for his wish to come true and then proceeds to show George how the world would have been much worse off without him. It's a good movie that the lovely Lady Leanne and I watch nearly every year. Well, of course, Joby is admittedly much worse off than George Bailey, and he has quite a lot to say in the midst of his misery. It's really pretty pathetic, but you have to have some empathy for him if you've ever been in a hard place. I'm not making light at all of his circumstances, but he really let it out. But he did not curse God. Can you imagine the enemy's frustration? (laughs) Ha ha ha! I love that. I love to make the enemy angry. Well, so after Job speaks for a while, one of the three friends who have come to sit with him decides that he can't take it anymore. He's got to say something. (laughs) Don't you just love it when somebody starts a conversation with you by saying, can I say something to you without you getting mad? (laughs) You know it's going to be one of those conversations. Well, that's how Eliphaz begins his talk. That's just how I would want a friend to start things off when I'm in agony. How about you? Maybe not. Well, then Eliphaz goes on to say that people reap what they sow, the implication being that Job must have done something to deserve what he's going through. Now remember, the only thing Job has done to deserve what's happening to him is to have lived a blameless life. Imagine what he must be thinking right about now as his well-meaning friend is speaking. Job was a better man than I, so maybe I can't really put myself in his place, but my guess is that he wasn't smiling in agreement with Eliphaz. Several years ago, my son Stephen was very, very sick. He was quite literally at death's door. His mom and I didn't know if he would live or die. And the people we appreciated the most were those who demonstrated love to us and to my son with their time and with their meals and even with financial assistance. They knew that all our time and emotional energy was invested in caring for our boy. That kind of friend is like a breath of fresh air. They bring healing and a ray of sunshine to a dark place. So be that kind of friend. Don't be an Eliphaz. 
I'd like to hear your thoughts on today's reading. Call the LifeSpring Family Hotline at 951-732-8511. And if you're outside the U.S., put a plus one at the beginning of that number. You can also comment on the show notes page for this episode at lifespringmedia.com slash s13e012 or email me at steve at lifespringmedia.com. There's a really good chance I'll play your audio comment or read your comment on the show. Tomorrow is Prophecy Friday, and we'll read Isaiah 7 through 11. Among other things, we'll read how Jesus the Messiah was prophesied roughly 700 years before his birth. We have a bit of extra time today, so I'm going to share something fun with you. For those of you who've been around for a while, you might have heard of a friend of mine, Brian Duncan. He was a member of one of Christian music's first rock, jazz, funk bands back in the 1970s. The band's name was the Sweet Comfort Band. I was a huge fan. After Sweet Comfort broke up, Brian had a very successful solo career. Well, I met Brian a time or two when I was managing a large Christian bookstore here in Riverside in the 80s because Brian lived in Riverside and he would come into the store to see how we were displaying his albums. And then once I started podcasting, I spoke to him after he was presented a gold album at one of his concerts. I don't think he remembered meeting me before then, but he gave me his contact info after our conversation. Well, I called him and asked him for an interview for the LifeSpring podcast, which we ended up recording at his home. Well, we developed a friendship over the years, and a few months ago, he phoned me to ask about podcasting and would I help him to do a podcast. Well, of course, I told him I would. His podcast is called Nutshell Sermons, and they're short, little, mostly about two-minute nuggets. The one I'm going to play for you right now is called You Send Angels. It even has a reference to what we've already read here in the book of Job. I hope you like it. Dear God, you send angels. Do you dress up angels in disguise, make them look like really irritating people? In your book, there's this one passage where it speaks of entertaining angels unaware. Lots of people like to jump on that little quote, but it just makes me a little paranoid. Several people have turned this angel idea into decent-selling books. I read that book, The Shack, by Paul Young, too, where he paints a picture of you showing up at the shack as a large black woman. I haven't seen large black women the same since. I find myself asking them big-picture questions like, So what's the future looking like for me? They respond by grabbing their cell phone and dialing 911. First time I asked, I thought she was phoning in a call to Angel Headquarters to get an answer for me. I was asked the other day if I was an angel. I was being pretty irritating. No, I'm not an angel, I told him. But you're no miracle worker yourself. So if I ask an unaware angel if they're an angel, are they going to tell me the truth? Angels don't lie, do they? Except maybe Lucifer. I heard he had a top position in your angel staff before he got fired. He lost his position to Michael for being, well, irritating, to put it mildly. I heard he took a third of the angel crew with him, too. Sounds to me like they have the potential for being unhappy. So maybe angels in disguise are not really your angels. I have noticed a few irritating people who show up rather magically everywhere. I don't see them dying off at all. So I gotta believe they might exist here. i just like to know whose side they're on. Thanks for letting me share. Amen. Well, if you like that, let me know. But even better, go over to NutshellSermons.com and tell Brian you liked it and that I sent you. NutshellSermons.com How did you find the LifeSpring Family Audio Bible? Let me know. Send me an email at Steve at LifeSpringMedia.com and in the subject line put, here's how I found you. If you're enjoying the show, please take a look at lifespringmedia.com slash support. Thanks to the team, Kirsty, Sean of San Pedro, and Denise. If you have a comment on the show, call the LifeSpring family hotline at 951-732-8511 or email me at steve at lifespringmedia.com. You know, they say sharing is caring. Well, show someone you care about them by sharing the LifeSpring family audio Bible with them. You might even help them to subscribe. Until tomorrow, may God bless you richly. My name is Steve Webb. Thanks for being here. Bye.